Good evening, everyone. Um, so my name's Katie Pryor. I'm the manager of education programs here at the Western New South Wales um, Primary Health Network. And we're really pleased um, to be bringing you the Respiratory Health Virtual Forum tonight. Um, this session has been a partnership um, webinar hosted by the Primary Health Network along with the Western New South Wales Local Health District. And we're really glad to be working together um, to bring this session to you tonight. Before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Western New South Wales and the connections to land, water and community. I pay my respect to Elders past, present and future and I extend that respect and a warm welcome to all First Nations people present tonight and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available um, afterwards for anyone who couldn't make it. All participants are on mute. So we ask if you can please use the Q&A button in your control panel to ask any questions. Um, we're really pleased to have a GP facilitator here tonight to um, facilitate those questions at the end of each presentation. Um, so, yeah, speaking of GP facilitator, we're really pleased to welcome Dr. Martin Watson tonight. Um, you may have seen Martin if you attend our Type 2 Diabetes Echo. He's a regular panellist there. Um, Martin has spent nearly 30 years in general practice in Burke and then rural Victoria and then returning to Orange and has been working at Colour City Medical Practice for the last five years. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Martin, and I'll now pass over to you to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Tonight's webinar will be presented by uh, three speakers, Associate Professor Bud Nanayakara. Bud's a staff specialist, respiratory and sleep physician at Orange Health Service and Associate Professor in Respiratory and Sleep Medicine at Charles Sturt University. He's also the medical director of the lab, Orange. Bud has a very keen interest in medical education and continues to be actively involved in research and publications. Bud's clinical interests are in interstitial lung disease, pulmonary vascular diseases, and chronic respiratory failure. Will also be addressed by Dr. Charles Prabaka. Charles is one of the two local respiratory physicians based in Dubbo. Charles trained at RPA and St. George Hospital for Respiratory, for Respiratory and then undertook two fellowships, the first in lung cancer at Chris O'Brien Lifehouse and the second in interventional respiratory medicine at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. Charles has been in Dubbo since 2017 and enjoys cooking on his multi multitude of barbecues and beekeeping. And our third speaker is Richard Hawksworth. Richard's a senior respiratory scientist at Dubbo Hospital. He was chief respiratory scientist at Talar University Hospital in Dublin, Ireland, before he moved to Australia in 2016. He began his career in pulmonary physiology in Manchester in the UK, followed by 11 years at Guy's Hospital in London. Uh, before emigrating to Ireland in 1999. His main areas of interest are airway challenge and exercise physiology. He's a clinical skills tutor to the medical students at the Sydney University School of Rural Health. And he's consulted for several clinical trial organizations in the setting up and the running of their respiratory, respiratory clinical trials units. So it's now my pleasure to hand over to Bud to deliver the first educational presentation. Thanks, Bud. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll just um, share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> I will hope you guys can see that. Um, I... So um, thank you so much, um, Martin, for that um, introduction. And it's uh, really a privilege to be here and um, talking in this um, Respiratory Health Symposium. Um, so um, today the talk is based on COPD and the title is When Puffers Just Don't Cut It. Um, so we're going to 
try and focus a bit more on uh, management um, after inhalers. But we do want to just touch base on the basics first. Um, so just a case study to kick us off. Um, a 61-year-old male from Forbes smoking three weeks until admission. Baseline function is poor with an exercise tolerance of only 50 metres. He's having difficulty doing gardening, does not like to shop because of breathlessness. And his um, deterioration has been slowly progressive. Now, two weeks prior to hospitalisation, he has noticed worsening lower limb edema, increasing cough and sputum production with purulence. He's also complained of three days of orthopnea. Background of COPD, uh, which has been diagnosed with pulmonary emphysema and chronic bronchitis, mild pulmonary hypertension, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, and osteopenia. Um, he's had a previous exacerbation with hypercapnic respiratory failure three months ago, and a CT chest done at that time showed marked bullous upper lobe emphysema. He's currently um, treated from an inhaler perspective on a neuroellipta, which is a long-acting um, beta agonist and a long-acting uh, muscarinic antagonist, so a, so a, a dual bronchodilator. I'd um, say to you that um, this is a, not an uncommon patient that we would all share um, in the Central West. So these are his uh, lung function tests. And uh, whenever I've um, uh, given lung function tests, um, the first thing I do when I'm looking at spirometry and probably the most important thing after you've um, decided that the test was uh, valid by looking at the flow volume curve um, is to have a look at what we call the spirometric ratio, which I hope you can see my cursor here, but that's a FEV1 on FEC. And we look here um, and the ratio is 0.33 or post bronchodilator, it's 0.32. So what that tells is that this patient has airflow obstruction. So if the ratio is less than 0.7, we use that as a mechanism of saying that this patient has physiological airflow obstruction. His FEV1 post bronchodilator is 52%. And you can see compared to pre bronchodilator and post bronchodilator um, values, and I'm sure um, Richard will um, take us through um, how to interpret lung function tests um, uh, more in his presentation but there is no significant change. So it's gone from 1.48 um, through and stayed stable at 1.48. So there was no response to bronchodilators. One thing about lung function, uh, particularly um, in terms of the FEV1, because I'm sure you, you would have heard um, patients referred to as having very severe COPD, severe, moderate, mild. And traditionally, that's been uh, based on the severity of the FEV1, which is the force expiratory volume that you can blow out in one second. And you can see, though there is a correlation with uh, worsening function, um, the correlation is not that great. So you can see that um, in these uh, patients with mildly reduced FEV1 here in the stage two patients, some of them have very bad dyspnea and uh, respiratory status in comparison to the patients um, which have very severe airflow obstruction by spirometric means. So if you see a patient who has an FEV1 of 35%, though we can make some assumptions about their respiratory status, um, you can also be um, fooled into um, thinking that they're a respiratory cripple when in uh, actual fact, um, they're coping just fine. So I think um, this is quite consistent with a diagnosis of COPD. And just to um, refresh our minds, um, it's um, a heterogeneous lung condition. It's characterized by chronic respiratory symptoms, and that includes breathlessness or dyspnea, cough, sputum productions, particularly if you have chronic bronchitis and airflow inf inflammation. Um, and its uh, cause is punctuated mainly by exacerbations. Now, it's due to abnormalities um, in the airways, which gives you that bronchitis or the small airways inflammation, so bronchiolitis. Um, and it can also involve the alveolar compartment, which gives you the gas exchange problems and pulmonary emphysema. Now, this causes persistent, often progressive airflow obstruction. 
And I guess we're moving to think about um, the development of COPD in terms of how a patient's underlying uh, genetic susceptibility. Now, the most classic one that you guys probably are aware of is alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, but there are a number of other um, implicated genetic markers, how that interacts with a patient's environment and how those two have accumulated over a period of lifetime. And we call that jetomics, uh, which is a pretty cool um, name. And the reason why time is important um, is if we focus on this graph here. So this is a plot of lung function or FEV1 over time uh, measured from um, birth uh, to, um, um, I guess, um, over the age of 70. And you can see that uh, people generally um, have um, their peak lung function around the age of 25. But there are a, a significant group of um, patients that never, for whatever reason, whether they were born with physiologically um, small lungs, um, they, might have, they might have had some neonatal trauma or chronic asthma as a child, they never obtained um, full lung growth. And so these patients, this group of patients is in, are incredibly susceptible to developing um, COPD and chronic respiratory disease as they age. And in fact, there's a proportion of patients that will develop COPD without having had, uh, without having smoked. Um, so that's an important concept to, uh, I think, think about. And I always ask um, new patients that I see about their um, prenatal and immediate postnatal history to get an idea of where they may sit in this curve. Now, in terms of a diagnosis of COPD, it is clinical um, and physiological. So you really do need to demonstrate that post bronchodilator, their FEV1 on FVC ratio is less than 0 0.7. Now, um, some of you may have heard that, um, is that the right kind of cutoff to use? Um, I use it because it's nice and easy to memorize. But if I just go back to the um, other page, you'll see that when you get values in spirometry, and again, um, Richard may go over this um, in a bit more detail, but there is a upper limit and a lower limit of normal. Um, so there's statistical variation and that changes as you um, age. For example, when you um, get a bit older in life, um, your lungs lose uh, natural elastic recoil. So the FEV1 on FVC ratio the normal lower limit of normal actually dips down. And you can see in this patient, the lower limit of normal is actually 0.63. Now, um, is that clinically significant? I guess there's a risk of overcalling patients um, and giving them a label of a disease when they don't actually have it. But I will argue that um, most of the trials where we um, tested um, therapy in patients with COPD have utilized patients, uh, um, have case um, found patients with this ratio. So it's something that I teach my medical students. It's easy to kind of remember. In terms of management, I just want to stress that it's really important to try and get the simple stuff right. So for example, um, try and get your patients to keep their vaccinations up to date. And that's influenza, pneumococcus, COVID now. And I think um, in patients that are eligible, um, try and get them to have a shingles um, vaccine as well. And the reason being is COPD can be considered as a disease of immunosenescence in, in some ways. And there is significantly um, increased risk of uh, varicella zoster reactivation. And shingles, as you know, can be incredibly nasty and debilitating. Um, so I try and um, I stress that to my patients. Smoking cessation, I mean, I, I don't need to um, mention this too much, but it's incredibly important. And that's been shown from the lung health um, study done a while ago. And it certainly does reduce the FEV1 reduction. Um, and you can see that um, here with sustained um, quitters and continued um, smokers, that there is a significantly reduced FEV1 reduction. Um, uh, rate of decline reduction, which is one of the only interventions that have actually shown this in long-term follow-up. So it's a really important thing to try and get right. 
Um, it also improves mortality. And again, it's we don't have too many things in COPD that help that we can help to improve patients' mortality, keep patients living longer. But smoking cessation is absolutely one of them. And in this same study, what they did was they did a brief kind of 12-week um, smoking cessation intervention. You can see that when you looked at them long term, um, the people that went through this program, the, the sustained quitters, certainly did um, better. Pulmonary rehabilitation is also important. And it's something that I still haven't got my head around as to the level of access in um, in our region, certainly know that um, Dubbo and Orange, uh, we offer pulmonary rehabilitation services, but it is something that helps reduce exacerbations, which is a seminal event in patients with COPD, as well as it's been shown in metal analysis to help reduce mortality as well. And um, the timing is probably post-discharge to within uh, 90 days of hospital discharge, where we really should try and get patients to come and see um, the pulmonary rehabilitation team. Um, perhaps there's a role for tele-rehabilitation as well. And so that uh, they're always um, looking into novel ways of um, increasing the availability of this um, vital service. Um, to just focus a little bit on pharmacological therapy before we get to some more advanced therapies, um, the new um, guidelines, international guidelines for COPD have now um, tried as best as possible to simplify inhalers and pharmacological therapy based on some of the big um, pharma trials that have come up um, recently, the triple therapy trials. And essentially the way to group them is to um, is based on either symptoms or exacerbations. And the reason for exacerbation is that it is a critical event in the life history of someone with COPD. And I'll, I've got some um, slides that hopefully will convince you that it's important to try and prevent exacerbations. In patients that are not exacerbating um, and um, they don't have too many symptoms, a simple bronchodilator should be um, sufficient. However, if they do have symptoms, either based on a um, MMRC score or a COPD assessment test score, now these are, are freely available on the net, then it's recommended that we try and maximize bronchodilation, try and maximize the amount, uh, or minimize the resistance um, to um, airflow in their symptoms and ho hopefully help reduce um gas trapping, which is a, a big uh, contributor to their um, those patients' symptoms. Now, if they have exacerbations, particularly two moderate exacerbations, now a moderate exacerbation here is defined as an escalation of therapy, which is performed at home. So either corticosteroids or antibiotics or one leading to hospitalization. And that's a severe exacerbation. If you have a patient that lands in hospital Due to an exacerbation of COPD, it's a severe exacerbation. Um, they've suggested starting with um, dual bronchodilators because there's certainly a, a wealth of evidence that supports um, the use of dual bronchodilators in this setting. But if they have a, um, a signature where they're eosinophilic, so if the blood eosinoph uh, eosinophil count is greater than 300, which is on the full blood count, if you look, it's greater than 0.3, um, within you know a 12 month period, then it, it is these patients where you should be targeting them with an inhaled corticosteroid. The higher the blood eosinophil count, the better, and probably the result of eosinophilic inflammation, the benefit for ICS happens um, probably about greater than 0.15. And there is a gradient of response. So the higher the eosinophil count, um, the, um, the better the response to triple therapy. The other thing to realize is um, there's a recommendation to use a single inhaler therapy. Um, and as you know, that there are multiple single inhaler therapies, um, all of which uh, none of them have been studied head to head. They never will be um, as none of them want to be proved to be inferior, but they all have their, um, their individual benefits. Um, 
So um, again, if we're going to have a look at triple therapy, um, where we're adding the inhaled corticosteroid to long-acting bronchodilators, and just one quick thing about um, bronchodilators, if you're going to use a bronchodilator in patients with COPD, it has to be on the background, um, on the backbone of a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. Um, LAMA has been shown to be superior to a LABA, such as um, Serenity. It's really hard to find them anyway. But, but that's an important um, kind of concept there. Um, so in patients um, who meet these uh, kind of um, criteria where they've got um, frequent exacerbations, their blood eosinophil count is greater than the 300, or there is a history of um, an asthma COPD overlap, um, strongly suggest using inhaled corticosteroids in this setting. Um, in terms of um, things to be aware of, um, um, and that would maybe sway you against using inhaled corticosteroids. Certainly, if there's no evidence of um, persistent eosinophilia, that's one thing. There is a there is definitely an increased um, rate of pneumonias, probably about in, in the range of two to four percent. Um, so that's something to be wary of, um, and or, um, also a history of mycobacterial disease, um, and that's. Um, in this region, um, non-tuberculosis mycobacterium, such as MAC. And I've seen a number of cases of MAC, um, especially in this um, area, um, probably disproportionately more so than whenever I've been training. I don't know if um, Charles um, attested it as well in Dubbo. So why exacerbations? Um, well, I guess if you get your first exacerbation, um, it increases the likelihood of having further exacerbations. And you can see here that um, time to further exacerbations greatly reduces. So you start to have exacerbation after exacerbation after exacerbation um, with these patients once they get on a roll. And, and we see that it's like the revolving door. Um, come winter, the um, patient comes in, you discharge them, they go out, they come in and in and in um, again. And absolutely an exacerbation is linked to uh, mortality. So if we have a look at this, um, this curve here, the um, one that highlights the one severe exacerbation, you can see if, you, if you're hospitalized uh, with a COPD exacerbation, at five years, about you know, roughly 30% um, of patients are dead. So it's a, it's a huge event in these patients with COPD. To progress um, the case, um, arterial blood gas, um, ar arterial blood gases were taken, and I've got a couple um, that were taken on this patient. So there's one taken two years ago, um, showing a normal pH, PO2. Um, definitely, there's um, evidence of hypoxemia there. That's not a normal PO2. Um, 68 millimeters of mercury, um, PCO2 within normal range. So I'd, sorry, I didn't include normal range, but that's 35 to 45 and normal um, bicarbonate there. Now, during um, this patient's hospitalization, um, you can see, and, and I think, um, I hope um, this is clear that this is a acute respiratory acidosis with the pH dropping below 7.35. Um, so this patient has um, acidemic, and that's driven by the elevated um, PCO2 level here, which is 65, which is greater than that upper limit of normal of 45. And correspondingly, they become hypoxemic as a process. And then I've got another blood gas after this patient was treated. And we'll go through what um, kind of treatment that we um, give here in terms of advanced therapy. But um, right before discharge, and, and you want to do a blood gas, especially if they've had a, a bad exacerbation with hypercapnia, you want to do a blood gas right before discharge when they're in this uh, when they're in a semi-stable state to see if they qualify for home oxygen. You can see here that their PO2 is 54, PCO2 is 59, um, and their bicarbonate has gone up to try and compensate for that um, slightly elevated um, PCO2. So the pH is normalized. So I guess uh, a couple of questions to answer. One, would you consider home oxygen in this patient? And this patient has quit smoking three weeks ago. Um, do they qualify for home oxygen? What is the evidence? So we'll, we'll try and answer that question. Um, and also, does this patient qualify for non-invasive ventilation? When would you use it? 
Should we discharge these patients um, using it? And I, I want you to think about some of the practices that you may have in your uh, rural hospitals. So focusing on non-invasive ventilation, acutely, if this patient has um, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure with respiratory acidosis, and I'd argue that this patient did, um, that is certainly a grade one um, evidence-based recommendation that this patient should have non-invasive ventilation. It improves uh, mortality, reduces the need for um, intubation, reduces treatment failure. And that's um, been shown in a number of studies. Um, it can be done in an ICU setting, which is um, probably the most common way that we do it here. Or um, if you have a respiratory ward with nurses that are, very, uh, that are trained in um, using an IV in troubleshooting, um, it can certainly be done on the, on the general ward. And there've been some um, nice randomized controlled trials, mainly based in UK and Europe that have um, um, proven that to be the case. So that's the first one. If um, In hospitalization, absolutely, unless there's an absolute contraindication to using non-invasive ventilation, like an untreated pneumothorax, go ahead, um, should be done. Now, the, um, an uh, another question is, um, should I be discharging this patient with this blood gas, um, raise CO2 um, on um, home NIV? Now, the, um, the evidence is that um, no, you shouldn't. So um, these patients, 50% of them, if you give them enough time, you know, about four weeks, their CO2, their gas exchange slowly Im improves. And so when they initially studied this group of patients to see if giving C um, NIV would help, it was a negative trial. And when they looked at it, it was because 50% actually their CO2 dropped down by themselves. So they then repeated the study looking at patients who had persistent hypercapnia. So a CO2 of greater than 52 to 54 um, two to four weeks post-discharge. And if you get, gave them NIV and it was NIV with the sole purpose of um, reducing their CO2, so high intensity NIV, I'm talking um, pressures of like 23, 24, 25 IPAP over an EPAP of four or five. So really high intensity NIV. Um, in that group of patients who had persistent hypercapnia post-discharge, there was a significant reduction in time to first um, presentation. And also, if I see a patient as a stable outpatient, haven't had exacerbations, but they have um, gas exchange um, issues such that their PCO2 is 52, then in that group of patients, there is an indication to use uh, non-invasive ventilation. When do you use non-invasive ventilation? We use it when they're most vulnerable and the most vulnerable part of their physiology is at nighttime when they sleep, when their muscles relax, particularly their um, intercostal muscles, their diaphragm um, and their upper airways, they're uh, very vulnerable to respiratory um, events, particularly hypoventilation. That's when NIV is most useful in the stable outpatient settings. In regard to oxygen therapy, um, in this patient, their PO2 was 54. So they would definitely benefit. So um, when we um, when oxygen therapy was studied in the setting of um, COPD, and it's really been the only respiratory disease where it's been best studied, it's in the patients with a PO2 of 55 or between 55 to 59 with um, end organ um, damage. So pulmonary artery hypertension, congestive cardiac failure, core pulmonary or polycythemia. In that group of patients, long-term oxygen therapy, not just nocturnal oxygen, not just nighttime, not just as needed, long-term oxygen therapy, so over 16 hours a day, has been shown to improve uh, mortality. And you can see that in two of these trials, um, the survival curves uh, are significantly different. And actually, interestingly, um, the the time that in which they separate is around the 12 month mark. And in, in this trial here, the MRC trial, it was actually um, after 40, uh, 40 months that you uh, start to see a proper separation in the mortality trials, um, in the mortality. So you need, the patient needs to be using it. One thing I um, often get asked is, should we be giving um, oxygen on a palliative care grounds? Well, um, the answer is if they're not hypoxemic, then probably not. 
Um, so um, oxygen therapy for patients with pal um, on the palliative care pathway on the, is only a benefit if they're hypoxemic. Um, so I wouldn't use it unless they're not um, unless they are very hypoxemic. There's no role for isolated nocturnal oxygen, and there's also um, no role for patients that with COPD that um, have uh, moderate resting hypoxemia, so an oxygen between you know eighty eight to um, eighty nine to ninety three. And um, they they also severely desaturate. So we all see these patients, they walk, the oxygen uh, levels fall to 80%. There's no role for long-term oxygen therapy in that. And that's been um, looked at too. In the interest of time, I won't go through some of the physiology behind this, but in patients admitted to your ward with COPD, keep their oxygen 88 to 92%. Now that's just not in chronic retainers. I would argue that that's for all comers of patients with COPD. That's a very safe um, oxygen rate right? because that will maintain delivery of oxygen um, to the vital tissues. Um, the last thing I want to focus on um, is um, some of the further things that we can do for our um, patients. And this is not in the acute setting. This is more in the chronic setting. And COPD, by and large, the breathlessness that occurs with COPD is really due to the effect of hyperinflation and gas trapping that it has on their um, mechanisms of breathing, their pulmonary, um, pulmonary mechanics. And that's because of the way the diaphragm works. So if you can see the diaphragm is this nice, beautiful uh, dome-shaped uh, muscle here. And when the diaphragm um, contracts, it, it basically pumps um, downwards. So it increases the vertical dimensions of the thoracic cavity, but it also squeezes the, the lower, the lateral rib cage sideways. So it increases the uh, lateral uh, dimensions as well through this thing called the zone of apposition. And um, what you can see here is this is a normal diaphragm, these nice, beautiful, long um, diaphragmatic fibers. But in COPD, due to hyperinflation, due to enlarged lung volumes, the diaphragmatic fibers are, not, uh, are shortened. And when they're shortened, they can't contract as well. So it's um, a muscle in a, um, in a geometrically inappropriate position for optimal contraction. The other thing is this, um, this uh, muscle pushes on the lateral aspect of the thoracic cavity through this zone of apposition. And you can see here the zone of apposition, that contact with the lateral wall is minimal. So it has minimal um, activity of pushing the thoracic cavity um, sideways. So presumably reducing the level of hyperinflation, one thing we do is uh, obviously bronchodilators, but other mechanisms of doing it, such as lung volume reduction surgery, bullectomy, certain bronchoscopic interventions aimed at reducing hyperinflation, well, um, that has been shown um, to improve, for example, for lung volume reduction surgery, mortality um, in carefully selected patients. It improves exercise tolerance, um, health status, lung function for some of these bronchoscopic interventions. Um, and so it's, it's certainly um, something to think about in these patients with severe dyspnea is to get them assessed in a, a lung function laboratory and uh, refer them to a respiratory physician um, who, who can then either perform it. And I think um, Charles may have some um, expertise in this area locally, um, but also there are places in New South Wales that may be um, doing, um, doing some of these procedures that can take on a handful of public patients as well. So just um, in the last minute, uh, which is my last slide here, just to talk about some of these. Um, so here, this is one of the um, one of the valves here. So basically, it's a valve that you put into a um, through a, a bronch bronchoscopy into a um, segment, and it's basically a one way valve, so that that um, lobe or segment um, is um, blocked from um, air coming into the lobe but air can go out. And basically what that does is it uh, facilitates collapse of that um, bronchial segment. And when that um, segment or lobe collapses, the other um, not, you know, normal lung helps to re-expand in that process. And overall, the lung volume comes down, the diaphragm goes back into that nice dome-shaped uh, mechanism of action. 
and everyone becomes quite nice and um and happy um so there's there's a number of different ways of doing that bronchoscopically i'm certainly uh, no expert in it and um but um it's uh, it's a, a quite an interesting um field um and i and that's my last slide um i think that's my um time up hopefully i haven't gone over time too much oh, that's very good thank you bud yeah really informative and uh, very helpful for me hopefully for everybody so we've got a short period for question and answer with bud now for about seven or eight minutes so please type your questions in So the first one here is, thanks, great points. Can you speak on the respiratory rehab a bit more? How do we achieve this remotely? Yeah, um, that's, an, that's a really um, interesting and good question. And I, I, I guess I'd like to open that up to the floor um, to see um, how we could do that. Um, this... Uh, I mean, undoubtedly, there is um, very strong evidence to support pulmonary rehabilitation, and that's um, uh, you know evidence-based pulmonary rehabilitation with you know a six to eight-week course um, program uh, with education, um, muscle strength um, training, um, aerobic uh, training, and um, th there's undoubtedly there's really good evidence um it's probably cost effective um based on economic analyses as well um in terms of uh, how do we achieve that in the remote setting that's a really um interesting question and i think the um i i suggest that probably the best um, approach there would be some kind of tele uh, rehabilitation service now I'm not really up to date in my evidence in regards to, um, you know, uh, pulmon uh, pulmonary rehabilitation from the telehealth perspective, but there's certainly um, trials. I know there's some trials based in um, Belgium that are trying to answer some of these questions, but I think that's probably the way we need to, um, to do that. Thank you, Bud. Thanks, Margiana, for the question. Christine Willis uh, says, great, thanks. Great, thanks. I'm wondering if we still have a res if we can have a respiratory clinical no, we still have a respiratory clinical nurse consultant at Orange Base. Yeah, um, thanks, Dr. Willis. Um, so, yes, so we have two uh, respiratory uh, CNCs or CNSs at Orange Base Hospital. They um, helped me out immensely. Um, they we run a public um, CPAP titration clinic for severe OSA, and they basically run that um, under my supervision. They do spirometry, ABG, six minute walk test. Um, they perform education, and also they run the respiratory chronic care program. So they do home visits um, to patients um, within the region. So we we have two. Um, as uh, with any area, we probably need more and uh, we need more dedicated services. We need an acute uh, respiratory nurse for the wards as well. Um, they're very stretched for time, but they do an amazing job and they've helped myself and Dr. Singh out immensely. here. Thank you. And Tim Jones asked, is the raised eosinophil count due to allergy or is there specific eosinophilic inflammation in COPD? Yeah, um, really great question, um, Tim. Thank you for that one. Um, so I think it's multifactorial. There's um, There are certainly um, uh, times where you can have an eosinophil count that's raised for another reason. And you can see that basically with the eosinophil count jumping up and then kind of coming down. Generally, eosinophil count, if they have underlying eosinophilic inflammation and it's not been treated, is quite static uh, and it's a reasonably reliable biomarker and yes um, there is evidence for eosinophilic inflammation in a subset of patients not all the patients in fact not the majority of patients but a subset of patients that we see in the hospital because they present to the hospital with exacerbations that certainly have eosinophilic inflammation in fact there are some now trials that are using biological agents, the most recent one being dupilumab, which targets eosinophilic-based inflammation, that has shown some evidence that they have efficacy, like they do in asthma, 
but also in patients with COPD with that eosinophilic inflammation signature. Classically, we always thought of COPD as kind of that neutrophilic inflammation, but we're realizing more and more that there's eosinophilic inflammation. Now, I've just, um, I was just reading today um, on the limbic, um, which is this um, nice readable respiratory digest that I get, um, that there was a trial published at the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, which is probably the best respiratory journal that we have, that looked at point of care eosinophilic testing in the primary care setting in patients having a moderate exacerbation and using eosinophil count. Now that um, cutoff there was 2%. And I, I've got to read the paper. I don't know exactly know what how you delineate 2% in our uh, laboratory. But um, in that in the patient group that had eosinophils of greater than 2%, then corticosteroids absolutely helped in acute exacerbation, but they didn't help if their um, eosinophil count was less than 2% in the blood. So there's definitely a good signal there, I think. All right. Thank you very much, Bud. Thanks for those questions too. Um, yeah, excellent. We'll move on to Richard. So, uh, yeah, we welcome you, Richard, to present. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen. Sure. Sorry. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. Can everyone hear me? It's good. Thank you. Great stuff. Okay. Well, thanks very much for inviting me to speak to this evening. Um, great privilege to be here. Um, so, yeah, so I'm a respiratory scientist and I've been here now since nine, 2016. And um, this talk is really about what services that we can offer here in Dobo and to a certain extent uh, in Orange also. So it's sort of like a, a mirror image to um, most of the tests that we can offer here. Okay, so yeah, so the first thing I noticed when I arrived here was how big the place is. And this is just a picture of our sort of our local health district. And um, interestingly, I kind of like thought, wow, this is big. So I did a bit, a few, few little sort of uh, Google, Google searches and I realized that our uh, local health district is pretty much the uh, size of the British Isles. Um, and being the, at the time, the only respiratory scientist in the region. It was, it was quite a kind of like a wow factor that um, it was like being the only scientist in the British Isles. So that uh, was quite a, uh, an eye opener. But essentially before I arrived, there was um, quite a few um, sort of like what rudimentary kind of respiratory services for spirometry. And in some places, um, some uh, six minute walk test facilities. So before I arrived, um, essentially patients, if they could take the time, have the money, have the uh, resources to actually go get tested, they would have to go to Sydney. And uh, this basically like a facility, this, this gave a good reason for a, a lab being set up in Dubbo. And then last uh, this year, um, Bud has set up his, uh, doc, along with Dr. Singh, his lab in Orange. So um, I wish them all the best. Um, so this is our lab at the moment. It's uh, in a brand new part of the hospital. We're delighted to be out of the old pan room in the men's ward of the uh, old hospital. Um, and as you can see, it's super clean. Um, it still is as well. Uh, this picture was taken about 12 months ago. So uh, just to give you a little bit of a, like a guide around the lab, um, in, the, in the corner there, we have a whole body plethysmograph. And that basically does the workhorse of the lab. It does all the tests. Um, to the left, we have um, our sort of specialist tests, which are uh, our exercise kit. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, shortly. So this is basically like our kind of demographics for like what kind of activity we've been doing. So back before, um, uh, back to 2013, there was very little, there was no uh, incumbent respiratory specialist. And um, as you can see, um, the numbers that went to RPA and North Shore for breathing tests were pretty low. So in uh, 2014, uh, Dr. Sagami Mal Malavathantri um, came along and she kind of started the service. Um, in 2015, we were lucky enough to get hold of a body box. And then um, I came along at the beginning of 2016. Uh, Charles came along 2017. And we went through almost COVID. And then Dr. Marvel Fantry um, 
uh, left the uh, health district. Um, and then in 2021, uh, our sleep specialist and respiratory specialist, um, Dr. Henry, arrived. So as you can see, um, the activity rates are around about 1,500 tests or 1,500 patients, I should say, a year. Uh, so that's distracted over the COVID period. And now we are back up to full speed and um, we probably will exceed all these numbers. This uh, this number here, I think, is um, uh, up to date. Uh, so we have another six weeks left. Interestingly, though, um, the age demographic of the patients we see is quite stark. It, it, it kind of says that the vast majority of our patients are um, over the age of 40. In fact, 90% are. Um, and that kind of just highlights the, um, uh, the older populations kind of lung diseases. So nearly 90% of my patients could have COPD. Um, a lot do. Um, a lot have interstitial lung disease. Um, some have asthma. But as you can see at the lower end of the H scale, this is pro primarily asthma land and in some cases, cystic fibrosis land for, for, for the, uh, the pediatric population. So this is our referral sources. So obviously we have our incumbent uh, respiratory specialist, Charles and Henry. Um, we have uh, some visiting respiratory specialist, Dr. Yi, uh, Professor Yee and Dr. McLean and Dr. McLean, Amy and Anna. Um, and we have... Um, external respiratory specialists from Sydney and indeed um, even Bud and uh, Dr. Singh send uh, patients to us who are living in the area. We do an awful lot of testing for the, uh, the anesthetic department um, and then we have our uh, other uh, medical colleagues who send us patients uh, to look at um, tests um, look at lung function in response to treatment that they're giving. So the oncologist would be very keen on uh, patients who were um, undergoing a bleomycin treatment regimen uh, to look at lung toxicity in terms of that treatment. And then we have the, the usual cardiac, the, the rest of the actual medical, because everyone can be breathless, uh, irrespective of their other comorbidities. And then we do uh, quite a lot of work for the pediatric teams, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, Dr. Asquith and Dr. Fabros, and they are uh, great supporters of our service. And then more importantly to our most of our audience tonight is the, the GPs. Patients usually turn up to the GPs first instance. And as a result of that, the um, uh, they are the first port of call. So um, I'll talk a little bit about how we do this, but the GP direct access program, I think is a, is, is really sort of like um, central to um, getting um, community chronic disease management um, f the forefront of a uh, respiratory in, in, in the community. So these are just a black like, list of activities that um, I kind of do. Uh, most of them are testing, <laughs> um, uh, but I do do teaching not only to the patients in terms of just educating them as best I can, uh, but we do medical students and nurses, obviously lots of administration, which I now have um, uh, resources, uh, separate resources to achieve. And we do a little bit of research here and there and clinical trials are probably are, uh, um, we're, we're hoping that maybe that, that will uh, develop in the, in, the, uh, in the future. So obviously we, we get patients who have got everything. So really kind of like maybe we should just call it lungs are us. You know, we have a, um, a huge range of different respiratory conditions that we look at. And our job or my job at the moment um, is to choose the tests that are the most appropriate to the actual um, uh, to, to, to answering the question. So along with um, Henry and Charles, uh, we kind of like look at the, the, the most appropriate tests to do to answer the question that's been asked. So I just basically just mentioned this bottom one, occupational screening. Occupational screening is, is a test that is um, for patients who probably are not patients, but they are wanting a job in a high-risk environment, such as mining, um, uh, if they want to be firefighters, police force, military, 
ambulance um, paramedics. So they, they, these are um, patients who get what people that are sent to us to just get a baseline assessment of their breathing in order for them to pass the medical. And certainly with COVID, a lot more came to us than did in the past. So what kind of tests do we do? Well, the cornerstone of respiratory physiology is spirometry. And uh, that's essentially why it's available in lots of places. But as we know, spirometry is very easy to do badly. And I think that that's the key focus on certainly our, my service is to ensure that spirometry is done to the best possible standard. And also that the bronchodilator assessment that is usually is associated with spirometry is done um, to a, um, a high standard so that the information we give back to the clinician, uh, the, 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 the GP or the specialist is um, the truth and they can use it with confidence going forward in their um, ongoing management of the patient. Another test we do is transfer factor. Um, that essentially in layman's terms is a test to establish how good the lung is at sucking oxygen up. So if you imagine the lung as an upturned tree, we have the branches and the, um, on the tree and that's assessed through spirometry to see how big those branches are and how many they are of them. Transfer factor looks at how many leaves you've got on your tree. So if you smoked, then you may have less leaves than if somebody hasn't smoked. I show the picture of our whole body plethysmograph. Whole body plethysmography is a really good test. Uh, re um, going back to what Bud was saying about uh, hyperinflation, this is a really good test to see the level of hyperinflation that's actually in the lung. And uh, the higher it is, the more the work of breathing, the more the perception of breathlessness. And that is something that can be therapeutically reduced uh, with the necessary um, uh, medications. Lung volumes by gas dilution. We, we, we have the facility here, but why do gas dilution when you've got plethysmography? Um, it's just a, um, a, another way of looking at uh, lung volumes, such as total lung capacity, residual volume, and um, functional residual capacity. We can also measure um, through our body box facility uh, muscle strength. Muscle strength is useful when we're looking at patients with neuromuscular conditions like motor neuron disease. Um, and uh, we can also um, in, in, um, introduce supine spirometry as well through our, through our couch we have. And, um, and that allows us to just look at the dia diaphragm involvement in terms of uh, the, uh, the ability to shift air in and out whilst lying down. We also have like a suite of sort of what we would call specialist tests. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these shortly, but uh, we have pheno, fractional exhale nitric oxide. We have also a suite of bronchial challenge testing. We can do skin prick allergy testing. We can do six minute walk tests for basic exercise assessments. We can also do full cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and we can do high altitude simulating testing, fitness to fly for those patients who wish uh, in fairness, it's the only way to get off the island is fly. So um, uh, if they um, have an underlying lung condition, we can give them the confidence that maybe they, uh, they can fly without any, uh, any undue distress. So from a GP perspective, the patient turns up, you're the first part of call, you do your interview, and you have a kind of hunch what may be the problem. And really that's where the uh, referral starts you kind of think, okay, I think this patient's got, for in this case, asthma. How do I prove it? So you send the patient into us, and we basically, um, between um, Charles, myself, and Henry, we decide kind of like how we're going to work on it. So typically, our first uh, suite of tests would be fractional hexhale nitric oxide followed by spirometry and bronchodilatory response. We can do skin prick allergy testing to see if there's any triggers. Um, I'll come back to these two in a moment. So fractional exhale nitric oxide is a very interesting test. It's only been sort of like, well, I'm saying it's been on the, uh, on the horizon, it's been on the horizon probably 20, 30 years. But it's only actually got really kind of like commercialized in the last, say, 10 years, I'd say. So uh, fractional exhale nitric oxide is a biomarker for inflammation. And it really has a, it, it's a nice little test to, to kind of push the barometer 
one way or the other if if uh, if the patient is query asthma is there anything that additional to the uh to the uh the testing results that push the barometer more towards it being asthma so on this slide you can see that this particular patient had red now red means significant inflammation um and that basically tells us that that's exactly what's going on significant uh, inflammation so again um would a anti-inflammatory be the appropriate medication for this patient and certainly in children um, this is a nice test to do with kids. It's quite straight. It's like an RBT test. Um, so people have seen it on the television and maybe sometimes had to do it themselves. Hopefully not. But in any event, um, they, they're able to um, uh, do the test. It's quite, uh, quite easy to do. And, um, and it allows the pediatricians to maybe feel as though, is there a need to put them on inhaled corticosteroids um, if, uh, if there is no inflammation there? So essentially, as I said, it assists in diagnosing of asthma and uh, patients with maybe um, eosinophilic inflammation. It's, um, it kind of gives you the insight into whether or not to actually prescribe corticosteroids. It's also very useful for uncovering uncompliance. Um, I had a patient in the um, few weeks ago that she was still breathless Symbicot two, two, two puffs twice a day. And it was only when, and, and, and high levels of pheno. And I said, mm, what's going on here? So anyway, eventually I asked her, how, how did she take us a, a Symbicot? And she showed me, and it was like taking a GTN spray. She just opened her mouth, sprayed it in twice, and that was it. And I said, do you not inhale? And she said, no, I was never told to. So, Wow. So this unexplained breathlessness that was the actual question was now explained. So hopefully when she comes back in six months time, having taken puffer properly, uh, hopefully her pheno levels and her symptoms will have improved. Um, and uh, going back to what um, Bud was mentioned about the biologics, um, certainly in asthma, um, it's uh, useful in identifying patients who would be a possible candidate for these biologics. So when we get patients in who are potentially asthmatic, um, we, we have two types of people. We have ones that come in with symptoms. And what we can do is we can give them a reliever and we can try to make them asymptomatic. So that's the bronchodilator um, kind of uh, theory. Um, from having symptoms to feeling better. And hopefully the FEV1 would have improved. Incidentally, um, the new way of um, assessing bronchodilatation is now looking at the, um, the difference between pre and post over the predicted value of what the patient should be blowing out in the first second, or indeed FEC as well. And this is why it's now critical to get the predicted values correct. So um, for all your GPs out there, if you ever do spirometry, then please get their height right um, because that way then your uh, predicted values will be correct and therefore you will be giving them the best chance to maybe get that more than 10% improvement on their predicted, not on their pre. Uh, so uh, that, that's maybe just a take on message in that respect. So. We sometimes get patients who turn up and their airways are pretty clear because asthma is episodic, good days, bad days, good days, bad days, good weeks, bad weeks. So if they just come in on a good day, then giving them a bronchodilator really isn't going to kind of like show any kind of significant improvement. So what we do with these patients is um, maybe on a separate day, um, we may basically then introduce them to a restrictor. And the idea of that is to recreate symptoms such as chest tightness, wheeze, cough. And that will give us an indication of whether or not they are susceptible to, um, to the, these, these restrictors. And the restrictors we use are methacholine and mannitol. So this is kind of like what we kind of term a provocation model. So basically like um, in in, bronch uh, in, in asthmatics, patients show an increased bronchial hyperresponsiveness and 
the uh, introduction of um, corticosteroids will normalize their hypersensitivity or hy hyperactivity, I should say, and that basically like improves their symptoms. So we use um, we use uh, bronchial challenge to um, assess whether or not the patient has increased bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Typically, though, usually we use bronchial challenge as a way of ruling asthma out. Um, uh, and therefore, the underlying medication that they're on should be removed um, with the caveat of uh, potentially increasing their ventilin usage. Um, so we're clear then that there is no confounders to the response. So we don't want them on a steroid, in my opinion, for weeks before they do the challenge because we don't want a false negative. We don't want them to be have a normal response and it's only because they have uh, been confounded by the fact that they're still uh, in L-steroid in the system. So another way of basically like looking at um, asthma is if somebody is not able to come to Dubbo for a challenge or they don't want to do it, some patients basically find the, the notion of getting wheezy and having a bit of an asthma event uh, not to their liking, uh, we can look and we can um, we can exploit the diurnal variation that we see in, um, in certainly in lung function. So here's a slide basically showing that a normal, uh, they have diurnal variation. The best is allegedly four o'clock in the afternoon, the worst is four o'clock in the morning. But with asthma, we have this exaggerated morning response. And, uh, and this can be um, sort of exploited to a certain extent by using what's called a peak flow diary card. So we, as you see, on this thing, we have untreated asthma, we have up and down, up and down, showing, um, you know, a morning dipping. And, and when we treat them, we can see that their peak flows improve and the variation decreases. So again, it's another way of getting to the diagnosis. So that's asthma. Um, a lot of my patients, however, have basically uh, lung disease. So basically COPD or interstitial lung disease. So really we do spirometry, but then we move into the, uh, the, the other kind of like fancy tests that we do. So we do transfer factor to establish, as you said, the, the ability to suck oxygen up. And that's useful, certainly in the diagnostic phase, Maybe uh, it's not as good in the surveillance phase. Uh, there are other more exercise related tests that I think um, predict the progression of a disease rather than transfer factor. Um, we also have our lung volumes, which I think is fantastic in terms of just looking at hyperinflation in people with COPD, uh, gas trapping, and also basically uh, the, uh, in the interstitial lung disease, the uh, reduction in total lung capacity that occurs with the progression of that disease. As I said, we can also do sort of like a, the sort of like six minute walk test. We can also do incremental shuttle tests, but the six minute walk test seems to be the, 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 uh, the exercise of choice. And then we have our respiratory muscle strength. Sometimes, obviously, as a patient becomes more hyperinflated, their inspiratory capacity reduces, and that basically gives them a lower respiratory, inspiratory muscle strength, certainly. Um, and, um, and certainly that is important in the choice of uh, inhaler um, because it's very, very important that when we choose an inhaler, we choose the right inhaler for the, uh, the patient. And then obviously uh, looking at the sort of end product of ventilation, which is a blood gas, but obviously a non-invasive version will be oximetry. And we can do that as well. So uh, we can do that either um, overnight or um, um, during, obviously during the six minute walk test. So once um, when, when we when we moved into our new 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 facility here, we 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 got a hold of a bit of money, and I thought, hmm, I'd love a CPAP machine. Um, this is really kind of like the, uh, the 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 premium kind of test that you can have in a lung function lab. Um, so this is one of our um, a very 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 fit physios, um, and he was a kindly post for the, our photo there. Um, but as you can see, it's um, it's quite a sort of complex test. It involves ventilation, ECG, blood pressure, pulse oximetry. So when do we do these sort of what we call integrative cardiopulmonary exercise testing? Well, normally in a respiratory field, it's to to explain why you're still breathless when your lungs look okay, your heart looks okay. What else is going on? So it's a really good test for maybe teasing out 
other pathologies. So this is just a, a you know sort of a diagram of a, an exercising tennis player, and as you can see that there's um, various sort of points within the actual um, exercising body that potentially could be a choke point to exercise performance. So we have our cardiac side, so we have our heart, we have our circulatory system to the lungs, pulmonary hypertension, we have our lungs themselves, um, and then we have our peripheral circulation. So we have a, a possibility that um, peripheral arterial disease, um, peripheral vasculature issues could be a problem in that patient's exercise tolerance. And then at the point of actual exercise, we have the skeletal muscle and that in itself is a, um, a plethora of um, potential um, diagnoses that could explain why that patient can't exercise. So it's a really good test for um, kind of like doing this sort of differential diagnosis. However, also in lung uh, respiratory medicine, we, we tend to use it um, for preoperative risk. So our anesthetic friends, um, here in Dubbo tend to use it for anyone who smokes uh, because they don't like surprises. They want to know if there's any underlying COPD, asthma, or anything like that. So I'm quite happy to do spirometry on them. And um, we, we do a lot of just spirometry, maybe pre and post possibly. And if there's something a bit odd, I might throw in transfer factor just to give them an idea of um, potential desaturation issues l later on possibly. So, what, how can we use CPET for, um, for kind of the betterment of like our surgical patients? We can look at post-operative mortality and we can also use it for resource management. So post-operative mortality is, are they fit enough to undergo the, um, the, uh, the operation? There's no point in obviously operating on somebody who isn't going to survive. Um, so CPET is a really useful tool, certainly in uh, lung cancer surgery and also the major abdominal and thoracic surgeries. Um, resource management is more to do with are they fit enough to get recovered in the ward or is it do we need to put them into an ICU bed? These are just another kind of like pot potential use for CPX. Um, The effectiveness of therapy is a, is a, is a useful one because um, I kind of think that um, heart failure is usually diagnosed by echo, um, but we can also pick it up on CPET and we can also see um, where um, the cardiac output improves due to therapy. We can see that quite nicely on CPET. And then finally, this one is more of a kind of like aspirational um, potential of um, doing just general fitness tests, because essentially the test is a fitness test. Um, you can be a super fit person like um, uh, Craig in the photo there. Um, and um, that potentially is an income stream possibly for the hospital, if uh, anybody further up the food chain than me is listening. Um, but in any event, um, that's a, it's a potential for that. So this is just a little bit of a fancy, fancy graphs for uh, when we do a CPET test. So this is just showing um, thing. So if you can see on the left-hand side, we do, uh, we measure carbon dioxide production via um, oxygen um, uptake, heart rate and ventilation. And this is at rest. So you can see basically that the lines are down at the bottom here. Um, heart rate 75, ventilation 10 liters a minute, no problem there at all. Um, respiratory caution 92, 0.92. So this is basically just throwing in the, um, the end of exercise. Um, so you can see now the heart rate's increased to 192. Um, the VCO2 is 4.5, the VO2 is 3.55. So essentially now we're producing more CO2 than we are consuming oxygen. I'll come on to that physiology in a moment. And we can see our respiratory quotient is 1.27. So that tells me from an effort perspective that this guy was working really, really hard. Uh, and at 192, um, I think that's the case and his ventilation is up at 136 liters a minute. So going back to that um, sort of like um, mismatch with carbon dioxide production and uh, oxygen uh, uptake, um, that's basically where we, um, you've probably heard of the term um, lactic threshold or anaerobic threshold. Um, so here, what we can do, we can utilize gas analysis to um, find out the moment where 
the um the the body starts producing lactic acid and typically um aerobically co2 and uh, the, uh, uh o2 is linear and when we get a deflection in that uh, line uh, that's showing that now there's extra CO2 and that's coming from the breakdown of glycogen um, and the production of lactic acid. So um, we can look at the deflection point and we can kind of like put a um, put a, a value on it. So if we stick that in the, the curve uh, on the graph, we can see that um, uh, this particular um, subject started lactate, lactating, I should say, maybe I should say producing lactic acid um, at around sort of 10 minutes, but you can see that he continued exercising for uh, 16. So interestingly, um, in patients with um, glycogen deficiencies in terms of breaking it down, like McArdle syndrome, what we see is we see that the um, as soon as they hit um, the lactic threshold, their VO2 just plat plateaus out pretty quickly, and they're unable to um, increase their oxygen uptake by breaking down glycogen because they're not able to do it. So this is just showing like a sort of like a population study of anaerobic, anaerobic thresholds in uh, uh, from 50 on to 85. And you can see basically the mean value is over 10 uh, milliliters of oxygen per minute per kilo. And that's really useful in risk stratification for patients undergoing major um, abdominal surgery. So this was a, a study done by um, Paul Alder and, um, and eight, Adrian Hall, older and Hall, yes. And uh, they show basically that um, that effectively like is that their, their fitness levels can be a good predictor of mortality. And um, anybody who basically can achieve a certain level during the CPX test, that can help you stratify uh, where maybe they should be uh, placed following surgery. And that just helps with sort of like bed management maybe in terms of um, that. So, Going back to how you actually get into my service. Um, so essentially the benefits are that um, you get a specialist input, not just from myself, but from Henry and Charles, who will basically report on it in context to the referral. Um, there's no need, what we're trying to do is not get you to send patients in just for opinion and management when maybe good lung function might actually help you um, keep the patient in, um, in, um, in uh, the, the general practice for longer. It's bulk build, so there's no fiscal uh, restraints on patients coming to see me. And it basically, as I said right at the start, it really sort of like, sort of like thumbs up for chronic disease management or chronic lung disease management in the community. Obviously, the limitations are that obviously we get paid by Medicare, you don't because you're not doing it. Although there are Medicare funding codes for GP, uh, GP spirometry. So how does the referral process work? Well, effectively it works on at the moment, if, if we didn't do direct access, you write in and say, please, will you look after our patient? Um, if it's um, a serious issue, uh, then we have a fast track. If it's not serious, then we have routine and those are the kind of the waking, waiting uh, lists we have at the moment for fast track and for routines. Um, anyone who comes in without, uh, as it stands, they come and see me in the lab I, uh, prior to them seeing the doctor and then they um, get treated and then they come back up to back to clinic for a specialist follow up down the line. GPs, as we said, can do office spirometry. They, they have that option. Um, and I'm quite happy to help with training of those people um, if, if that's the, the choice. Um, however, what I'd like to see is you viewing the hospital lab as your own respiratory lab. Um, I need you. I, I, I have no problems at all in basically you writing in directly to, um, to us here in the lab. Um, obviously, um, we need you to put either Dr. Henry's or Dr. Charles's names on the uh, referral letter uh, because um, they are the uh, Medicare providers. Um, but they, um, what that does is it actually gives you direct access to the respiratory lab. Um, sometimes we get referrals from, from you for routine management. And um, 
the guys might actually retriage that to for just to come straight to the lab and they then can then get reported on and then sent back to uh, you and the patient then has a GP follow-up with that specialist report and that then hopefully will give you the uh, the direction to move into um, rather than um, sort of like not in the dark as such but with so with a lot more information to help you help your patient and all that process I would be I, I would like famous last words of course um, to be able to sort of do that in under four weeks from the moment that you send your um, send your referral in, there's always exceptions, but um, that would be what I would see because I think that it's a really important way of getting the uh, accurate data specialist report back to you um, as soon as possible, so you can then help your patient in the community and keep them in the community rather than sending them maybe uh, prematurely into our service. And this is our um, our external referral form. So this is um, available through the powers that be um, afterwards. So please feel free either to contact me directly if, um, if you want more, um, if you want it sent differently. Uh, but essentially all I need to know is the patient's name, address and contact details. We need to know the referrals details so we can obviously send the results back to you. Um, we need to know a reason for the test. Um, whatever it is, we will do Charles, Henry and I will decide basically like what the tests that we want doing um, to answer that question. There is a few contraindications. So obviously if somebody's acutely sick, then they're probably not gonna be able to do the test properly. Um, so we will wait. Um, so sometimes there is a delay and that's only because they're probably not in a, uh, the correct uh, uh, condition to actually do the test properly. And then at the bottom, we have our specialist tests. Usually, uh, feel free to have a tick and we may ignore them or we may not, depending on how we basically like progress through to answering the question. So, yeah, so essentially that's our that's that's the service. And uh, I really hope that, um, you know, going forward now, um, we'll be able to sort of really sort of like kick on after COVID to um, to sort of uh, improve the diagnosis of respiratory disease in the community before you start giving out inhalers. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Richard. I think everyone in that Dubbo region are really uh, would be thankful for um, really benefiting from your service there. My apologies for not getting to the questions in the chat when Wood was speaking. Um, thank you, Wood, for answering, I think pretty well all of them in the chat. If you want questions dealt with in this Q&A session, Put, put your questions in the Q&A um, section rather than the chat. Um, if you want to send something directly to one of the speakers, then you can do that through the chat. So I've got a question here, Richard. Are patients to phone your service to book their lung function tests or are they supposed to wait to be contacted by the admin staff? Well, I have now admin staff available. So probably wait to be called um before i had this extra resource i probably would have said phone um now at the end of the day i i really it doesn't matter the most important thing is that if the patient really wants the test done they will take ownership and they'll get it done so i i have no preference um the most important thing is that um the referral gets dealt with as soon as we can Thank you for that. Now I'm having trouble getting into the chat for some, oh, here it is. Yeah, I don't think there are any other questions. If you have any questions, put them in pronto, please. We've just got a couple more minutes. Otherwise we can go on to, on to Charles. Okay, I'm just looking at the webinar chat, actually. I'm just looking at uh, Lorraine. Is it typical mannitol which dehydrates airways to cause bronchoconstriction or methacholine, which acts like histamine? Well, um, mannitol is a, a direct um, agonist. Um, sorry, an indirect agonist, sorry. Um, so that sort of works in a kind of like a mechanistic way to um, cause the airway to contract, whereas methacholine is a direct uh, stimulus to the airway. So effectively, methacholine, if you give them enough of it, 
they will cause you to get wheezy. But we're looking at a physiological relevant dose range for, um, for methylcholine. Uh, with mannitol, um, if you ain't got asthma, you won't wheeze. Um, so that's why it's such a good kind of test. The only downside to mannitol in my experience is that it is a cough promoter. So certainly if patients are coming with cough as their primary symptom, um, I don't like making people cough to the point where they are uncomfortable. And, and in most, and in a lot of cases, the quality of the spirometry is compromised. So spirometry is the end parameter. Uh, if we can't get good, honest spirometry, then it kind of like negates the test a little bit. Um, let me just have a quick look. Um, We've got a couple quick... of other questions, Richard, in the Q&A. Yep. Do you have any preferred patient education resources? Um, well, only what I can yarn with them when they come in. Um, I, 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 tend to, um, I tend to sort of um, explain to the patients the, the tests we've done uh, in terms of spirometry, uh, transfer factor in the terms of the upturn tree scenario um, and also the uh, the hyperinflation state and I think um, I think if I if I if I if I do it in plain English uh, and and because I'm English I'm pretty good at that um, and therefore um, I can get a message across to them that they they kind of understand what's happening with their airways and more importantly why they're taking the medication um, and that is a useful tool as well because um, if they buy into the program, then I think that their um, their their adherence to the the the, uh, the, the, the medication is uh, is is improved definitely. I think the question might refer to Alice's question might be about patient resources, uh, like on a website or written resources. All right. I'm well, sure. uh, she look. I mean, the, the the I mean the Lung Foundation, um, the Asthma Society. I mean, they're all out there um you're right um we probably could get some leaflets um but um yeah yeah it's it, 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 a resource issue i would say to get these things in and done um but it's a point and um, I'm, i'll note it and um we'll um we might we might get some in because in ireland we had the irish lung foundation that basically um that gave us lots of pamphlets on all the respiratory diseases so oh, I'm sure, Alice, there's some, sure there's something similar here in Australia. Sorry, Alice is just saying uh, to help people prepare for testing. Ah, right. Okay. No, no. Usually it's um, it's not, and it's never really been a problem. Um, I explain to them when they arrive what we're going to do, and um, yeah, I mean, usually lung function testing is pretty standard. It's non-invasive, really. Um, obviously, if they're coming for a more um, invasive test, then we will we will speak to them personally before the test. Um, but you're quite right. I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe we should have some literature, but at the moment we don't. Uh, thank you for, thanks for answering that. And the last brief one is, is there an age limit? Uh, no, but usually there's an age limit on the downside, I, actually on the younger side. Typically spirometry is need, you need to understand instructions. So children can basically be sometimes a little bit kind of like uh, not interested, a uh, little bit childish, dare I say, <laughs> but that's not unusual. Um, uh, so usually I say about six or seven, maybe, depending, kids kids develop differently. Um, uh, usually uh, my, my, uh, my clinic uh, coordinator, uh, Paolo, he um, he does a great job, and he um, he uh, I've told asked him to basically ask if the if the child is able to do the test, um, able to follow instructions, and then the, the the parent will say yes or no. In some cases, if it's no, then we'll say uh, we're not we're not going to do the test. Um, but in terms of upper limit, no upper limit. I mean, um, I've done I've done patients over a hundred years of age. And, oh. uh, so it's, and you'd be surprised. Um, some people, some really elderly people can do the test so much better than a 30 year old, you know. Well, thanks very so, much, Richard. My pleasure. Thank you. We'll go on to Charles. So please welcome Charles uh, to present the final topic for this evening's program, bronchiectasis. Thank you, Charles. Pleasure, I'll just share my screen.
So this is a patient really where I'm not sure I've really succeeded on. Um, perhaps I shouldn't present her. Um, and I do have a lot of barbecues, but I'm down to three and I have two beehives and I got stung on the weekend and I looked like they had Botox. It was absolutely marvellous. Um, so Barbara was referred to me after being cared for by one of our external respiratory physicians. And at that point in time, she had an established diagnosis, COPD, emphysema and bronchiectasis. Her care has been a little bit fragmented by um, both her, um, what was the phrase that uh, Joel used the other day, lack of personal responsibility um, and the fact that she keeps on seeing various locums, either I'm, or my wife is having babies and I'm taking paternity leave or um, she was, anyway, so she's seen by, seen by various locums along the way and that sort of interrupted her care uh, and then uh, COVID also shut down some clinics for a while and she got lost to follow up for that as well. Um, but her initial CT from 2012 demonstrated emphysema and bronchiectasis. When she first met me, she had pretty severe lung disease and FEV1 of 0.9 litres at 41%. And she had a significant eosophilia. Um, and that suggests maybe a component of reactive airways disease, or perhaps like Bud was talking about, it's just an indication that she'd benefit more from inhaled corticosteroids if she frequently exacerbates. <clears throat> she had an unusual CT, and I've got, got that on the next slide, with extensive central lobular nodularity and the established bronchiectasis. She had um, a sputum culture positive for sensitive pseudomonas. Um, and because I was quite worried about her with all these changes, I bronched her as well, and we found pseudomonas and staph. Um, I eradicated her staph, and I did attempt to eradicate the pseudomonas, but I didn't probably push on for long enough with the eradication therapy, and we failed, um, which is also not surprising because pseudomonas is very difficult to get rid of. And when you look at the next CT scan, you'll see how much volume of disease she would have had. She was quite hypoxic when I met her and I commenced her on home oxygen. And given her frequent exacerbations, I commenced her on azithromycin for exacerbation prophylaxis, mostly for bronchiectasis. In fact, most of her care is focused on her bronchiectasis rather than her airways disease. The COPD and emphysema, bronchiectasis fits with airways disease. So here you've got her CT scan just sort of picked randomly from different uh, heights in the lung and we've sort of got uh, in the wrong order. So we've got this CT scan. This is the upper portions, mid portions, lower portions and towards the bases. And you can see that there's emphysema, these little black holes. There's clear bronchiectasis. You've got uh, dilated airways here and we'll go through the diagnosis of that. Multiple dilated airways here. And then there's just dots. There's like dots everywhere, tree and bud changes very much just absolutely everywhere, just horrible looking lungs. Um, in 2019 and 2020, she had multiple courses of both IV and oral ciprofloxacin for recurrent exacerbations, or not IV cipro, but IV timentin or kefepine or whatever else throwing it at the time, and then transitioned over to oral, got oral with the GP. I tried her on hypertonic saline and nebulized antibiotics and she didn't like those. And so they didn't continue. Um, and in fact, I even sent her for a percutaneous lung biopsy because I was just was so concerned about this nodularity. I didn't understand what was going on. I really wanted to see under the microscope, or well, not me personally, a pathologist. And it just showed a non-specific inflammatory infiltrate. So we didn't really help her at all. This is her 2020 CT scan. You can see that there's more dots and more like this is all tree and bud changes. These are the ones. I don't know if you can really appreciate it over the projection. And there's more dilated airways, this bronchial bronchiolectasis so more bronchiectasis but more of the terminal bronchiol so everything was getting much much worse 2021 COVID we lost it a follow-up didn't see her for a while 2022 she was seen by malocum again in mid 2022 she was worse um she was on dual um, bronchodilator therapy and I didn't know whether an ICS would benefit her or not I didn't feel like she was getting a lot of COPD exacerbations, but everything was mostly bronchiectasis. But she did have the raziosophils. She'd fallen off the azithromycin trolley, so we started that on her again. And in fact, I referred her down to Professor Lucy Morgan in Sydney at Concord Hospital for a uh, second opinion. Second for me, third after she'd already seen the other respiratory physicians. Fourth, fifth, I'm not sure what worked to. And this is a, just a CT scan more recent. And you can see now, you can really see this beautiful tram tracking over here and, and here. There is more lung destruction. Here we're developing into cystic bronchiectasis. You can see these sort of varicocele dilatations over here. 
Um, 2023, she'd had recurrent exacerbations and ended up in hospital and was started on NIV and ICU. And after the second exacerbation within a um, four week period, I think it was, we commenced her on domiciliary and IV, which seems to be holding her out of hospital. Now I referred her, as you can see back to Lucy in 2022. And again, um, Barbara really hasn't taken a lot of um, positive steps to trying to get down to see Lucy. I, I, every time she came to clinic, I'm like, have you called Lucy? Have you tried to speak to her room, seeing where your appointment is? Oh no, oh, they called me once and they said they'd call me back. And she just was very passive in this sort of a process. She finally saw Lucy, who told me that she had severe progressive bronchiectasis. Um, she wasn't sure of the cause either. Uh, her more useful statements were that she needs a lot more aggressive sputum clearance. Um, and that's because Lucy felt uh, you could see a lot of sputum plugging. And I perhaps haven't picked good slides to demonstrate that. Um, and suggested the addition of doxycycline as a rotating antibiotic in addition to the azithromycin as a prophylactic antibiotic to try and reduce your exacerbation frequency. And there is some data suggesting when used with uh, beta-lactams in uh, pseudomonas, it can actually stop spore formation of the pseudomonas and keeps it more sensitive. Um, so it's a useful addition. So to, uh, later on, I... I really didn't think she was suitable, but I did speak to St. Vincent's for a lung transplant workup. Um, Barbara was very eager for this. Uh, she didn't want to die. Um, and again, um, I don't know why I said never sent down. Uh, never went down, I think is what I wanted to say. So they reviewed the referral and they said that she wasn't appropriate. Um, she was a little bit too old. Um, there is quite poor outcomes with uh, bronchiectasis associated transplants. And there was a lack of personal responsibility for her own health uh, as sort of the trippy, triple whammy for why they politely declined her. What I can say, which is quite nice to see, is that the addition of the, um, um, the um, NIV seems to have reduced her exacerbation frequency. Uh, share. All right. So what I'm talking today about is non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, which is a different kettle of fish to CF. And the, the data is actually can be opposite in certain ways. So what is bronchiectasis? It's, it's abnormal and permanent, permanent dilatation of the segmental airway. It's likely due to neutrophil mediated damage. So the immune system is attacking something and there's air, airway bystander damage. It's associated with loss of cilia. So they're the little hairs that beat to move mucus north out of the lungs. Goblet cell hyperplasia, the cells that produce mucus, and obviously epithelial wall damage. And you can see on the sidebar there, the uh, side um, picture, what it looks like. There are three types: is cylindrical, varicocele, and cystic bronchiectasis. <clears throat> so you've got the normal airway. You can see it tapering down here. C cylindrical bronchiectasis, the airway loses its taper. Varicocele bronchiectasis, you start getting dilatation of the airway in like varicose veins, and then cystic, the process gets worse and you get this marked destructive and then you can just imagine how big this is and all the phlegm and bacteria and mucus just sits in all these air these as an air fluid level in these areas and they just cannot clear this pus out of their lungs so how do you make it well you've got to have the symptoms so a chronic cough with ideally with sputum production but may not can often be dry and you've got to have the abnormal airways on the on the ct scan um <clears throat> so what history do you take from the patient? They're talking about recurrent respiratory tract infections, lower respiratory tract infections, although you may want to consider sometimes upper respiratory tract infections, especially if they've got ciliary dyskinesia syndromes, and then you're thinking about your CFs and your cartilaginous syndrome patients, patients who may have that and you haven't diagnosed it yet, uh, how much phlegm they produce and what colour it is normally, how, how does it affect them, what is their dyspnea and how far can they walk, um, have they coughed up any blood, any previous antibiotics that they may have used? Did they get wheezy with it? Um, risk of tuberculosis, because this can be a common cause of severe bronchiectasis. And in fact, I've just got a new TB patient uh, last year who now has quite severe and almost just complete destruction of the left lower lobe from um, a misdiagnosis of TB. Um, any chemical exposures that might have damaged the lung? Um, your cleaners out here seem to want to mix bleaches and acids together and they're producing uh, chlorine and gas and it's quite toxic to the lungs. Um, and do they have chronic cough uh, and signs of reflux to go with that? What do you do? 
well, this is what my baseline investigations are. Um, but can pipe up in the chat if I've missed anything. I check the immunoglobulin levels, particularly the subclasses as well, and I may check the vaccine response if I'm a little bit worried about it. Um, I will do the CF gene if I think it's appropriate. So I have a 40-year-old lady I recently, well, about four years ago now, diagnosed with CF bronchiectasis as a 40-year-old as a after she presented with recurrent chest infection and had upper lobe bronchiectasis on the CT scan, which is very unusual. Um, I'm obviously going to do a sputum culture and I make sure I do that at least yearly and prior to any exacerbations, I'll also repeat it and I'll send it off for the full gamut of tests. Um, the AFB not looking for tuberculosis so much, although it's always fun to find, um, but looking more for mycobacterium, um, non-tuberculous mycobacterium such as MAC or um, um, like things like mycobacterium colonia. Um, I may look for alpha-1 antitrypsin, especially if they've got significant emphysema. Um, rheumatoid factor, um, if they've got a lot of sputum plugging, um, ABPA screening, uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Um, I'm obviously going to do some imaging to confirm it. And the reason why I've written MDCT versus HRCT, the HRCT is a gold standard for diagnosis, um, but it's probably not so critical in the 21st century as every CT scan has a HRCT component available. I'm sure you've looked at PRP and Loomis imaging uh, and they've always got the 0 0.9 or the one millimeter cuts and that's a HR availability of a HRCT. Uh, and so you don't need to dedicately order a, CT, a HRCT. Keeping in mind that a HRCT has one purpose, which is to look at the parenchyma structure of the lung. It's not a better CT. It's not a, while the name is high resolution, it's a bit of a misnomer. There's no higher resolution than a normal CT scan. Uh, and in fact, on the old, the old HRCTs, you could miss small nodules as the CT scanner used to skip one centimeter levels. Again, modern CT scanners, that's not true. But if you're looking for a lung cancer or a lung nodule, you just want a CT chest with or without contrast. If you're looking for a parenchymal lung disease like ILDs or bronchiectasis, then HRCT is what you should be ordering. Um, some patients with ciliary dyskinesia or suspicion of ciliary dyskinesia, uh, you can do uh, ciliary motion samples. Now, this is significantly unpleasant. The patient has to go to Concord Hospital. It's not so unpleasant that, although our country patients don't like traveling to Sydney, um, but they have to get a live mucosal biopsy done, uh, which apparently is quite unpleasant. And then that's put under a confocal microscope with, with Lucy and her lab staff, and they look to see the ciliary beating under the microscope. So looking for um, nice uh, coordinated movement and not discoordinated movement or absent ciliary. And obviously we're gonna do lung function testing, spirometry, and, and really we should be doing uh, full lung function testing with Richard or at Blood's lab if you're in Orange. Bathurst uh, with um, Bridget. So radiology, so you're looking for, for tram tracking and I'm not sure if this uh, projects very well, but you can see down here at the base is a little uh, thickened airway and my sidebar is hanging over the thing. So let me just move you out the way. Uh, yeah, so I think that's what we're talking about there. So some tram tracking just down here, and some subtle tram tracking over here and probably a little bit just here as well. So that parallel way, definitely, actually there's a great one just there. So if you can see in the upper lobe, that parallel bronchiole, uh, bron uh, bronchus, segmental bronchus airway, that's classic tram tracking. You're looking for signet ring signs. You've got an airway which is dilated larger than its associated blood vessel. So you can imagine a, a ring with a jewel on top, a signet ring. So that's what you're looking for. This is obviously quite marked. And up here, you can see a bit of tree and bud change and even some bronchiectasis right there. So you've got a little signet ring sign here. There's your blood vessel and there's your airway. Tree and bud changes. Again, of course, we're only gonna show you the most gross pictures. And this is just fantastic tree and bud change. Um, but it might be a lot more subtle than that, like we showed, or more scattered and, and diffuse. Um, airway wall thickening. So we've got here, I think, let me just move my side, bar apologies. Um, you've got a little bit of airway wall thickening, a medium amount of air wall thickening, and then a lot of air wall thickening. And that's just a sign of inflammation. And then retained secretions. And I do like this photo. So you've got obviously cystic bronchiectasis. And in the bottom of that, you can see these air fluid levels. And, just, just disgusting amount of phlegm. You just want to make sure the patient coughs. You just want to make them cough. It's just so much. And then obviously the final part over here, you've got destructive cystic bronchiectasis. So in this patient, you've lost a whole segment here. It's just turned into just 
dead, horrible, infected, chronically infected cystic bronchiectasis lung. All right, so what is the cause of it? It's this beautiful cycle. So you get somewhere you enter into this process and you get um, inflammation and damage to the lungs that start up here and that leads to impaired mucociliary clearance. So the phlegm sitting there. Sorry, every time I move my mouse, it seems to click. I'll try to do it less. Um, those um, dead bacteria release destructive things and uh, activate various parts of the cleanup process of the lungs, which causes more damage to the lung, uh, perhaps even mucus plugging as well. You get more phlegm sitting in the lungs, so the, then you get more bacteria living in the phlegm. That leads to more inflammation. You get more activation of neutrophils and macrophages and leukocytes and all the other kind of cells that come along and attack them. They release more chemicals and that further damages the airway. And so you get bigger damaged airway and they get bigger damaged airway and you get bigger damaged airway. And each time you do that, you get more and more phlegm sitting in that airway and more and more immune system activation and more and more damage to the airway. And it just keeps on going. And you know, then you've got your escape route here, early death. So what are the causes? Uh, I mentioned reflux in your history. So you're going to look for recurrent aspiration and reflux. And that you know, depends on who you believe is, is a, a strong driver or less strong driver. You look for bronchial obstructions. Um, I, my favorite one was one that Brendan Yee sent me. He sent me this patient for a bron for bronchiectasis. And I looked at the scan and I said, I think there's something in that little airway. And I went in there and there was this little orange thing in there. And it was quite brittle and I took it out um, and I sent it off to the lab and it came back as starch. And I actually think looking at when I pulled it out, it was an inhaled corn chip. It had that sort of orange color with all those little black spots you get on it. The patient never could recall it. But anyway, his bronchiectasis got better when I removed the endobronchial obstruction. It can also be caused by uh, tumors or hematomas or endobronchial sarcoids uh, and, and uh, carcino um, carcinoids blocking the airway. Extrinsic compression of the airway, such as the lymph node or a, or a mass, particularly lymph nodes, lanky windermere syndrome, right middle lobe bronchiectasis. And that's probably also to do with the right middle lobe structure, which is quite slit like. So if you go in, it, it looks like this rather than a nice round airway. Um, we've sort of brushed on the ciliary impaired sputum clearance with ciliary dyskinesia. And you can also get it with trachobronchomalacia and megaly. And I, I personally think that it's one of those chicken and egg things. You see the patients that come with chronic cough and you look at the airways and they're already starting to get quite distended and, and, and stretched from the chronic cough. And that's just from the constant back pressure. And how much is that from bronchiectasis driving the trachobronchomalacia and the chronic, from the chronic cough and the driving the trachobronchomalacia and how much is the other way around is very hard to know. But certainly it's one of those things I do try and get on top of in the chronic cough patients, it is a reason to treat it, or at least control it. Although we all know how much I love chronic cough. Um, immune paresis, um, so low IgG levels, um, defective um, common variable immune deficiencies, things like that. Uh, obviously HIV, we always like pointing a finger. CF, whether it's typical and non atypical. Uh, some infections, I've touched on tuberculosis, pertussis is the other common one, but any severe lung infection can lead to TB. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, that's a, it's a quite an interesting disease. It's associated with an allergic response to aspergillus, and we prove that with both an IgE and an IgG uh, specific titer, or you can do skin prick testings, which Richard, actually, I don't know if Richard does aspergillosis, I should ask him one day. Um, and it's associated with asthmatic patients. Uh, quite strongly or cystic fibrosis and it's a, a, one of those diagnoses you make it outside of one of those groups of patients you've really got to question whether you're doing the right thing um, and smoking um, what do you people grow well at the top you've got the five most common different um, grubs uh, bugs they grow homophilus pseudomonas streptomoniae moraxella and um, staph aureus and then obviously you're going to grow mycobacterium aviums. So the, or the, I shouldn't say mycobacterium, non-tuberculous mycobacterials and uh, aspergillosis are the other common things you look for, but you look for all organisms when you culture these patients. Most underlying causes of bronchiectasis are untreatable. Obviously, if they've got an I, uh, IVIG deficiency, um, IgG deficiency, you're going to replace it with IVIG. You're going to remove the foreign body. But otherwise, it's pretty hard to actually treat the underlying cause. 
Uh, and so most of the treatment focuses on symptom and exacerbation control. And as Bud said, especially exacerbation control, because exacerbations are associated with lung function decline and lung function decline and exacerbations associated with death. So I removed the foreign object. So this is a drawing pin I took out of a patient's lung. He was a taxi driver in Perth. He would, he was sitting at the light. He was cleaning his teeth with the drawing pin and the light changed. He put his foot on the accelerator and, and he had the most horrible teeth. I remember they were tied on with a little red string. Um, I just want to send him to the dentist. Um, open compressed airways, that's a little bit more controversial, but certainly if you can, that may be a benefit by removing the extrinsic compression. Stents are more likely to cause problems. Treat reversible causes of cr chronic cough. There are uh, five treatments, uh, asthma, um, certain drugs, chronic infection, if you can get on top of that, um, reflux, and post-nasal trips. You want to try and get on top of those if you can. Uh, treat the ABPA. Uh, so... Thankfully, with our new drug, mepiluzumab, well, it's not right new now, it's a few years old, um, if we can get patients onto that, then we can get their ABP under quite good control. And it's usually pretty easy to get them under control on that. Um, give them IVIG, treat their TB, obviously, uh, and treat their reflux. So when you, when, you want, when you want to treat the exacerbations, you're going to look at the, the patient and not the, the, the numbers, not just if they're a little bit um, tachycardic or hypotensive, hypotensive, you're actually looking to see if they're coughing up more phlegm, not rather than just them turning up, you know, they've got bronchiectasis and they're a bit more unwell and saying it's the bronchiectasis. You want to make sure you're treating the right infection. Um, with bronchiectasis, it's very possible just to get ordinary pneumonia in a different load than their bronchiectasis. And so you're trying to work out whether they've got pneumonia or just a simple exacerbation. Always send a sputum culture off if you can before you start them on antibiotics. Um, Look at their previous culture to guide your antibiotics. So if they've grown pseudomonas in the past, then you are going to want to use anti-pseudomonal uh, medications. So there's an exception to that, which I'll get onto in a, um, yeah, in a second. Um, uh, if they've grown homophilus in the past, then treat the homophilus uh, while you're waiting for the sputum culture to come back well. If they're well, then you can use oral antibiotics. Um, and I've said avoid fluoroquinolones because, and I've said consider Cipro cautiously, because you will drive resistance to uh, ciprofloxacin quite quickly. And typically within one or two weeks, you'll get uh, ciprofloxacin resistance to the uh, pseudomonas. If they are pseudomonasly colonized, then you only want to use tazacin, kefepine or keftazabine, and that, or meropenem nowadays. And that's what we're going to be doing in, in hospital. Um, and uh, you want to aim for 14 days worth of treatment, um, oral or IV. My son would like to come say hello. Daddy, hmm? can I close the time? Well, you have to go in my bed because I've got to finish this talk, okay? I'm not even close. Well, go, go get a book and sit on the lounge and do a puzzle book. <laughs> Apologies. Um, chest physio is really important. Um, we used to do, especially at RPA with our CS, we used to do a lot of manual chest physio. And now we're focusing more on the patients doing chest physio using devices or other uh, techniques. Um, and, you know, my personal bugbearers is the use of steroids. Uh, no studies have looked at the use of steroids in bronchiectasis. They don't seem to work. So please come on, Finlay. Go read a book as well. Um, so don't use steroids unless they're having a concomitant exacerbation of airways disease and they're wheezy. So if they're having asthma with if they've got ABPA or if they're having a COVID exacerbation on top of that, then you can use the steroids. But if they've just got your standard bronchiectasis exacerbation, then please don't use steroids. Um, if they've got a non-tuberculous mycobacterium, they're going to have to come see one of us about that because it's going to take it's difficult to treat. You've got to work out when to treat it. Is it the MAC that's causing the problem or is it, or the MOT that's causing the problem or is it the other bugs in there? Um, triple therapy, you've got to use a macrolide, pyrethromycin, resistromycin, rifampicin and ethambutol. I've written as generally poorly tolerated and that's probably not fair. A lot of patients tolerate it really well, but uh, the older you get, the more difficult it is to tolerate. I was used to be very didactic and, you know, you've got to use triple therapy. And if you're not using triple therapy, you're going to kill the patient and drink, drink, breed resistant MAC. I've become calmer as I've gotten older and more gentle. 
And I'm now doing a lot more like I'm aiming to get into triple therapy, but I'm introducing one agent and then giving them a month and then introducing the second agent, trying to slowly step them up onto it. Um, and I'm trying to use more, um, I'm looking at using in some of my more resistant patients or patients poorly tolerated, using some of the newer anti-tuberculous medications like um, Bedeliquin or a Protonominid or um, Clofazamine. Uh, and the lab in Westmead uh, seems to like my idea and are running some tests on my patients for these kind of tests, uh, these kind of bug resistances now. You've got to treat for 12 months after they get a negative culture to try and uh, sterilize them. And you'll often get recurrence of the disease. And it's not clear if you're getting recurrence of their previous Mac, Mac, Mac or MOT, or they're getting a new infection. Um, I, again, will often, I used to be quite didactic about this, and nowadays, I'll often treat for a little while until the patient doesn't like it anymore, they feel sick and unhappy, then I'll give them a treatment holiday and then I'll come back. And I consider it more of a suppressive therapy rather than a treatment therapy. Um, uh, so ABPA is, you need that pre-existing diagnosis, cystic fibrosis or asthma. Uh, you want to demonstrate this positive aspergillus response. Um, you want to have C sputum plugging and you want to see elevated incidence as well. And you, this is the old treatment, steroids at half milligram per kilogram for about three months. Um, but nowadays what I'm doing is once I establish them on for a long enough period of prednisone, then I call it an exacerbation and then I'm able to um, access mepiluzumab from the government, which is very efficacious in controlling the ABPA. It seems odd that shutting down their immune system seems to control an infection, but actually what we're trying to stop is the eosinophilic destruction of the lung. Uh, to the aspergillus, which is just an environment allergen. I breathed a bu bunch of aspergillus in, and that's what you've got to do. Um, so the old adage, adage, prevention is better than cure. Please don't tell our patients that soap and water is cheaper than visiting me because I am free. So, so what you want to do, the other portion of it is not the antibiotics. That just treats your exacerbation. You don't want to have to put them on them. What you want to do is stop trying to break that cycle. And so if you remember that circle, it's about the phlegm sitting in there because the bacteria gets in there, then the immune cells get in there. So you want to get the, you want to break that cycle. And the way you do that is sputum clearance. Uh, and so I describe this as hitting the bottom of the sauce bottle. So patients go, I can cough phlegm up all the time. I'm like, great. Yeah, you move phlegm from here to here and then out. What I want you to learn how to do is move phlegm from here to here to here and then get it out. So hitting the bottom of the sauce bottle. So you can do chest physio, active cycles of breathing therapy. And I just want to plug uh, Lucy Morgan's bronchiectasis website and I'll put it in the chat after I hang up and bring it up. Um, uh, after I close my presentation, uh, there's huffs, there's percussion, you know, the old style like this. There's postural drainage. And what I do is I send them to Amber and I say, Amber, get the, do sputum clearance. And she looks at them and she works out what chest physiotherapy they can do and if they need devices. And there's a whole pile of things. There's a um, flutter, a cappella, there's a pep mask, there's a vibratory chest thing, which is a great thing. It's this vest that they wear. And it's got these little bladders in them and you hook them up to a little mini air compressor. And, it goes, and so like chest physio, but for it's Amber will fatigue doing this for half an hour, this machine can just beat the crap out of this patient's chest for as long as necessary. And then there's a sputum alteration like hypertonic saline and, and mannitol. Uh, so this is just active cycle of breathing therapy. Um, and I won't go and st stop and, and make a uh, look at that. Uh, these are the various devices. There's the, um, the, um, the, um, the oh, what's the ball one called? I can't remember, Amber can put it in the chat. And you blow through here and the ball goes duk, 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 duk. And that back pressure is transmitted through the airway into the phlegm and it causes the phlegm to vibrate. And that changes the viscoelastic properties of the phlegm. And much like non-Newtonian fluids, it makes the phlegm more liquid. So it's easier to cough up. Uh, there's the acapella device, which has got this little um, spinny thing in it. The reeds, the aerobiker, and there's the, the vibratory chest thing. These are really expensive. Um, the studies of sputum clearance are really poor. I always say this, if you want to get a study out, do go do a chest physio study or a, a physiotherapy study in general. Like if you can get, you know, 10 patients, it's a pretty good study. 
There are, the last time I looked, there's a Cochrane review of seven studies with 105 patients. They're short-term studies, they're poor reporting. But what they do demonstrate is there's improvements in health-related quality of our life outcomes. Patients cough less. They cough at more phlegm, albeit eight meals, not a lot, but it's still better than being in there. Now, here's the more important things. Um, they have an improvement in FEV1 and FEC with that, that vibratory chest thing, about 150 mils, which is not small. There's reduction in hyperinflation, and Bud said that this is the primary driver of breathlessness is hyperinflation. Um, when I do my endobronchial valve talks, that's about 50. When you do the, and um, when you look at the studies, about 50% of the breathlessness comes purely from dynamic hyperinflation. And if you can remove that or reduce that, that's a big improvement. Um, you'd think, but there's no data on sputum clearance reducing hospitalizations, but no one I'm aware of would ever think that there's not a reduction. Um, what about using uh, uh, pulmonary rehab? Um, so it's, there's definitely an improvement in their patient's walking distance if they do um, combine pulmonary rehab with the acapella device uh, in both their, uh, what was this, incremental shuttle walk and this is their endurance walk. So, it, you know, this is probably more about the pulmonary rehab being more beneficial than the device itself. Here you can see that there's no change. You know, how do we read this again? Uh, so the group breathing a cappella device, there's no change in their FEV1. There's no real change in their FEC. And, you know, I think this is probably unhelpful, but there's no change in their respiratory muscle strength testing. No significant change. Hypertonic saline. So Prof Bai was one of my mentors at RPA. He was a CF consultant. And um, he noted, well, actually his patients noted and told him that, one of them went and said, when I go surfing, I notice that I cough up a lot more phlegm. And we know that exercise and surfing is quite um, an aerobic activity, increases sputum clearance. And so, you know, but he thought maybe there's more to it. And so he did a study where they nebulized hypertonic saline. Uh, so 3% salt solution versus uh, sodium chloride, normal saline and demonstrate a significant improvement in their um, sputum clearance. So that's how hypertonic saline came about. So you can see here, uh, there is a bit of a change in their FEV1, not a lot, but again, enough to be happy and in their FEC as well. So they're moving more air and they're moving it quicker. Uh, there is a significant, like here, look, this is their SGRQ, SGR, SGRQ score. So you can see uh, the minimum clinically important difference is between two and three. And so the normal saline group is in the light blue and the hypertonic saline 7% in this study is over here in the blue and they're going 14, 15 points. This is huge changes in their symptoms, in their impact scores and their total overall scores. So this is just absolutely amazing. Again, similarly with their um, sputum clearance and ease, and, ease, and, uh, ease of sputum expiration. So this is the sputum weight, how much sputum they coughed up. So you can see more sputum was coughed up with hypertonic saline. Um, the visual analog score for uh, the ease, so the lower number is better. So it was significantly easy to cough up. There was no real change in their FEV1 and no real change in their FEC in this particular study. And then the sputum viscosity again, isn't it disgusting what we measure? Hypertonic saline, the, um, the sputum is thinner and easier to, to cough up. Again, they can access that through the hospital pharmacy, but we have to be prescribing it. Manitol is probably not as good as hypertonic saline, but it did result in delayed exacerbations, which is good, um, but didn't reduce their frequency exacerbation. So once you're exacerbated, you just kept on exacerbation. And the SGRQ, SGRQ score did not fall as much. Um, macrolides, this was like the big thing when I went through um, as my training was the introduction of macrolides to um, uh, exacerbation prophylaxis. So using uh, 500 milligrams of uh, azithromycin three times a week in those patients that were exacerbating. That's much like the inhaled corticosteroids um, data for COPD. In those patients that exacerbate, there's a benefit. In those patients that don't, we don't know because we haven't studied that population. So you can see here the capillary graph and the, the divergence in terms of the exacerbation frequency. And quite early on, you can see already at, at two months, there's been fewer exacerbations. And by just under a year, what is that, 240 days, 50% patients are free of exacerbations compared to only 
about 30% of patients are being free of exacerbations off azithromycin. The caveat to using that is QT prolongation. And I unfortunately have one patient who I tried to kill by putting him on uh, azithromycin, uh, perhaps a little unwisely. Uh, he was supposed to come back for an ECG and actually he did. And it, he didn't have any QT prolongation, but he presented a week after that with um, Torsars de points and he was on uh, methadone and some psych agents uh, on top of that. And so he had uh, QT prolongation, quite embarrassingly. Charles, uh, just about out of time. Oh, no, I've got to speak faster. And you grow resistant organs, which is bad. Nebulized antibiotics, they don't really do that much, but they do reduce the coliform count. Uh, Pulmazine kills people more often, so it works for CFs, but doesn't, uh, it doesn't work for non-CFs. And there's no real evidence for inhalers outside of those patients that have the normal reasons to use an inhaler. Surgery is reserved for severe disease. So there's uh, one lobe that's severely affected and that lobe is now starting to contaminate other lobes and cause bronchiectasis and that. Recurrent minor homoptosis um, or if you're really, really struggling control of resistant organisms, but I've never actually seen that, although I speculated on that. Um, if they're coughing up blood, it's very bad. Uh, we do a CTA autogram. We look for the bronchial artery and then we try and embolize that. And we're really fortunate. We've got a, a fantastic trio of uh, interventional radiologists down in Orange who just absolutely love me sending them uh, bronchial bleeders and they'll just sort it out for me. And that is it. I'm sorry for taking too long. Oh, I can't hear you, Martin. I'm sorry if you're talking. Sorry. Thank you very much, Charles. I hope a fair bit of that can stick in my head and for the rest of us as well. Um, there's a couple of questions. Do you recommend normal saline in the absence of HT? Uh, no, I don't think it has any evidence that it makes a significant difference. And not to say I don't use it occasionally, but no, I think if you're going to need to nebulize something, then hypertonic saline has the benefit in sputum clearance. And then there's another one. Did you say don't use oral or inhaler steroids or both? Uh, both. So inhaled corticosteroids have got a role in reactive airway disease like asthma and in preventing exacerbations in COPD patients um, with um, frequent exacerbations. If you don't have that kind of patient, it's really difficult to say, and there's no studies that I'm aware of for inhaled corticosteroids and bronchiectasis uh, outside of those normal indications. And similarly with oral steroids, there used to be this, you know, there was airway inflammation, so we should give them steroids. And that really is evidence-based, not non-evidence-based. So there's no role for oral steroids in a bronchiectasis exacerbation. Again, outside of those patients who are having airway inflammation and are presenting with that wheeze as well. Just one other last quick question is clarification. Does azithromycin increase rates of antibiotic resistance? A hundred percent it does. Well, not a hundred percent. It brings them up by, I've got it on my slide, which I raced over. I apologize because I spoke too long. Um, there's a couple of my graph. So 88% of uh, resistant organisms, 88% of patients will have resistant organisms at the end of it versus about 12 to 26%. Thank you. Thanks very much, Giles. And we're really thankful for all of you for the excellent presentations that you've given for your time. And I appreciate just getting to know you a bit better, actually, too. Um, for everybody else, please scan that QR code that you can see on the screen or click the evaluation link that was sent earlier today in an email to complete an evaluation survey. We look forward to receiving your feedback. And yeah, thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, excellent. Thank thanks, you. guys. Bye. Good night. Thank you all so much. We really Thank appreciate you. your time. Thanks very much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Talk soon.